Banar Adili is the founder and director of Mint Press News and is a regular speaker on responsible journalism and dissecting the war narratives. Adli is also the executive director of the nonprofit Behind the Headlines and hosts and produces her own podcast, Mintcast. Adli is a Palestinian American who lived under Israeli occupation and apartheid from 1997 to 2001. After witnessing grave human rights abuses and suffering from PTSD, she found courage and catharsis to speak up for those living under war through her journalism. Mint Press and Behind the Headlines investigates how special interest groups influence policies at home and abroad. In 2009, Adli became the first American woman to wear the hijab to anchor and report the news in American media. She produced and hosted Behind the Headlines on Free Speech TV, covering think tanks and war issues, reaching 39 million households daily. So thank you so, so much, Minar, for being here with us today. Thank you everyone for being here today. It's an honor to be here with the People's Forum and uh, with Al Auda. And I love seeing that Palestine flag back there. I took a nice picture of that with Jacob. Yeah. Um, I am the director and founder of Mid Press News, and it has been quite a journey in working in American media. But my journey first started, and my awareness became first started and began when I was nine years old when my parents decided to move us from the very pristine and perfectly manicured lawns of Minneapolis, Minnesota to move us back to Palestine, to their homeland. When I said goodbye to Minnesota at that time, I was nine years old. Little did I know that this move would completely change the course of my life. At nine years old, we arrived at the airport at Ben Gurion, and for all of those that say it's too complicated, a nine-year-old girl was able to figure out at that time that I had just moved under an occupation. We had just moved into the world's one of the world's worst humanitarian police states. We were questioned, interrogated for eight hours, treated as suspect as Palestinians going back to their homeland. We were faced with uh, soldiers bearing arms directly at us and intimidated. And at nine years old, I would go to school now in this new land where at many times, the children in my classroom, after the first, second intifada had broken out, in many days, I would look around me and there were children missing, desks empty because they were being blocked from crossing through checkpoints. At nine years old, I had to go through checkpoints to get to school, to visit family. At nine years old, I would look around and the military, I would witness very regularly the Israeli military bulldozing homes. It was not complicated. It was very clear that we were living under an apartheid state, a police state, a brutal state that was committing grave humanitarian abuses against uh, Palestinians. Of course, I was lucky enough to hold an American passport and to get access through checkpoints at many times, while Palestinians, native Palestinians, trying to get to their families' houses, to hospitals, um, to visit family, were being blocked at these checkpoints. And so, I had lived under Israeli occupation and apartheid for about three and a half years. The last year that I was living there, I remember sitting on the rooftop of my house, watching uh, fighter jets dropping bombs on homes in Ramallah. This was just the daily life of Palestinians. War had become so normalized for all of us. We were so numb. Two days before my parents decided to move us back to America to our comfortable life, because they too could not handle occupation anymore. My dad couldn't work, my mother couldn't work, we were running out of money. Israeli settlers had planted a bomb at my aunt's elementary school, all girls elementary school. And two days later, 
we moved back to America. And I was in a culture shock once again. I was now 12 years old, much older, a little bit brighter, but have now been awakened to what life was like under Israeli occupation and apartheid. And when we arrived back in America, everything was so calm. There they were, those green manicured lawns, the traffic, the birds. Everything was so perfect and quiet. And at 12 years old, my mind was racing. Although it was silence in front of me, it was calm. The people were smiling. My brain, my mind would, stop, would not stop racing and thinking about the people that I had left behind. My aunt, whose school had just had a bomb planted by these Israeli settlers. My neighbors who had had their water cut off. The children in my classroom who maybe couldn't make it to school. This was all that I could think about. And at 12 years old, I knew it wasn't complicated. I turned to the media to get answers, to find out what was going on back home. And while all the kids in my school were talking about, you know, fashion, sex, drugs, you know, preteen stuff, all I could think about was the war that I had left behind. And so when I had turned to the media, I turned on my CNN, my MSNBC, my Fox News, New York Times, Washington Post, all of the American media, they had completely distorted the occupation. It was the narrative flipped upside down. Israel was presented as a, as a beacon of democracy and human rights, fighting against terrorists of Hamas, and that all Palestinian women were oppressed by these very violent men. I witnessed Islamophobia firsthand. And I also witnessed for the first time at 12 years old how the media worked. It acted as a mouthpiece for the state of Israel. It acted in the interest of the occupation. I mean, why not? The United States arms Israel to the T, $3 billion per year with weapons. Israel acts as a proxy state for the military industrial complex to fuel and fill the bank accounts of the weapons manufacturers the, director, the directors of the many, many, many weapons manufacturers at Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Raytheon, and General Dynamics. And yet, everybody I talked to said, oh, it's complicated. Because that's how the media presents it. It's a religious war between Jews and Muslims. It's a fight over Al-Aqsa. Yet no mention of occupation, of colonialism, of apartheid. Not once was this mentioned. And although this was my first experience with uh, corporate media propaganda, I knew at that moment, at 12 years old, that I wanted to become a journalist to change the face of American media, to help build bridges with people to see the truth of what it's like to live under war, because it's really not that complicated. A couple of months later, the new semester had started, now it was the fall school year, and I was in a new grade. I was now 13 years old, and 9-11 happened. I was sitting in my classroom when the Twin Towers were hit. And within just a couple of weeks, I believe it was CNN had played footage, or within a couple of days of 9-11, played footage of Palestinians in Gaza celebrating 9-11. And that's how they presented it. Look at the Palestinians in Gaza. They're so happy that America was hit by a terror attack. Well, little did people know that those celebrations of Palestinians passing out candy was actually footage from one year earlier of them celebrating Eid in Gaza. Once again, 13 years old, I had witnessed how corporate mainstream media manipulates, plants stories, and presents them as facts. Mainstream corporate media are the largest purveyors of fake news. It's not independent media. 
And as a young girl, I saw that and witnessed that firsthand, and this became the driving force that lit the fire beneath my feet to speak up for those living under war. Because after 9-11, it wasn't just Palestinians who were demonized. It was all of the Middle East, all of Africa. It was all Muslims abroad and brown people abroad to promote the idea of NATO, to promote the forever wars, the war on terror, and the occupation and exploitation of people abroad. And so from there, my journey into journalism began. Every day, every school project presentation, I talked about uh, becoming a journalist. And of course, when I made the decision when I was 19 years old to wear the hijab, my own family told me that no one would take me seriously. No one would hire me because now we're living in a post 9-11 world. And yet, the more I was told no, the more, of course, that just fueled that fire beneath my feet. You don't tell a woman no. She's going to keep going. <laughs> And so, um, in 2009, I became the first American woman to wear the hijab to anchor and report the news in American media. But of course, I wanted to talk about the fact that uh, the United States was engaging in over 137 acts of war overseas, but no producer would want to take these stories. I wanted to talk about uh, Israel's occupation of Palestine and why our military, or how these executives at Lockheed Martin and Raytheon were benefiting from these wars. No one would take these stories. Why were our veterans committing suicide at such a horrific, horrific rate? No one would want to cover these stories. So I was there reporting, smiling, dressed nicely and neatly like every single one of these anchors and reporters, but I was not allowed to speak up for the oppressed. I was not allowed to uphold our First Amendment the way journalism is meant to act as a watchdog in a functioning democracy. Once again, after college, I realized that the only way to challenge these narratives, because it is the media that is continuously allowing for the occupation to continue. It was the media that acted as an arm, as the mouthpiece for the military industrial complex. That I had to become the media. We have to create our own media. And that's where Mint Press News was born, with a focus on uh, looking at how special interest groups, public relations groups, are influencing policies at home and abroad. And through our reporting, it became very obvious that the media had a conflict of interest. We no longer have even a mainstream media anymore. We have an extremist corporate media beating the drums of war. And that is because the media is working directly with weapons manufacturers, it's working directly with NATO-funded think tanks, it's working directly with big tech and Silicon Valley, it's working directly with figures and individuals that are coming out of NATO and Israeli-funded think tanks to act as public relations within mainstream corporate media. The New York Times right now the New York Times receives gag orders from the state of Israel on what they can and cannot publish about the occupation. The New York Times right now, they are, their uh, Jerusalem Bureau, they ethnically cleansed Palestinian family home so that they can build their bureau. So we don't have a mainstream media anymore. We have a mainstream corporate media beating the drums of war. And so through our coverage at Mint Press News, we are covering the occupation in a way that exposes not only the profiteers, but the many conflicts of interest that exist between the mainstream corporate media, the state, and Israel, and the lobbies that exist in this country. I'm told that I have to wrap it up, <laughs> so I will, but I really appreciate you all being here today, and I'm happy to answer questions about this later on. Thank you so much.